Hi, History Makers. Eric here. While we're working on the next season of Making Gay History, I'd like to introduce you to my second favorite LGBTQ history podcast, The Logbooks. My friends Adam Smith and Tash Walker take us on a trip through time drawing on notes made by volunteers at Switchboard. That's the UK's LGBTQ helpline that's been serving the community for more than 45 years. I've laughed out loud and been moved to tears, and I'm always left wanting more. Season three of The Logbooks has just been released, but since December 1st is World AIDS Day, I'm sharing with you an earlier episode called Please Be Gentle. It's the first of three devoted to the HIV AIDS crisis, a heartbreakingly beautiful piece that showcases what The Logbooks does so well. Have a listen, and since I know you'll want more, you can find all their episodes at thelogbooks.org or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode contains stories about illness, death, and ill treatment and discrimination of people living with HIV and AIDS, which are terms used interchangeably in the logbooks and this episode because of the time period. This is a logbook entry from December the 21st, 1989, 6.45am. I had just finished with a call with a 19-year-old man named John from Norwich who had been diagnosed HIV positive. His lover hit him and walked out. John is full of self-loathing and can see no point in living. He eventually went off to sleep and I got him to promise to rim back in the next two to three days. This is a tiny news clipping from Capital Gay on August 24th, 1984, taped into the logbook. 61 AIDS cases. There are now 61 cases of AIDS according to the latest figures released by the DHSS. Deaths from the disease have also increased from 30 recorded cases to 32. It just feels very scary because in these logbook entries it's starting to feel like there is this thing and it's very real and it's growing. Yeah. You know, is this really growing? Is it just gay people? What is it? What, yeah, what is it? What's happening? I think just just fear really. You're listening to The Logbooks, stories from Britain's LGBTQ plus history and conversations about being queer today. In partnership with Switchboard, the LGBT plus helpline. I'm Adam Smith. And I'm Tash Walker. In this season, we're reading through the notes made by the volunteers who took calls between 1983 and 1991. Episode one, please be gentle. This is the first of three episodes this season where we're going to be talking about the HIV and AIDS epidemic. When we were talking about planning this theme, HIV and AIDS, and realising that there are so many logbook entries about that and it's such a huge part of our LGBTQ plus history and it's going to be such a big part of the Logbooks podcast we realised right that we had to basically spread it over three episodes yeah definitely and of course HIV and AIDS is still very much uh, around today and pervades the entirety of this period of time that we're talking about but we really want to specifically dedicate those three episodes to HIV and AIDS directly it's not going to be chronological or, or definitive either Yeah, I guess we should tell listeners that there is some difficult material coming, but there's also stories of life and living and strength and finding power um, and community through this time. Yeah, definitely. And that's one thing that's that's really jumped out to us um, about the stories that we've collected. So you're going to hear some voices from people who talk about their experience of being infected with HIV in the early years of the epidemic, including those who called Switchboard for help. Uh, We're going to hear from a nurse and a doctor 
and of course former switchboard volunteers who heard about it all before anyone else. So let's start, as always, by listening to the stories of those who lived it. Put yourself in Matthew's shoes, a young guy just going out for the first time. I'm Matthew Hodson. I first went to a gay club in 1983 when I was 15. And I was still six years below the age of consent for gay men at that point. So I lied about my age and told people I was 16. I thought that was a bit better. And I went in and they were playing this incredible music. It was high energy music and I'd never heard anything like it. And I had almost anticipated the place to be full of people who looked like John Inman or people wearing long overcoats or something like that, Flasher Max. Um, but instead it was full of gorgeous men with moustaches and check shirts and tight jeans dancing to this incredible pounding rhythmic music. And it was the sexiest thing I'd ever seen. And I met this guy. Uh, he was 32, he was American, he was a photographer, he was working on an assignment in London. And we got chatting and he invited me back to his hotel. And we did what we did, and that was fine. And I thought, okay, tick, I've done that now. I was living in a little village uh, near Stratford upon Avon. I was, I was at home, at, at my parents. Hello, my name's Lee Chislett. There was a programme on the telly called Killer in the Village. It was like Horizon or Panorama, one of those. And it was showing, I think it was San Francisco or New York, showing these gay men coming in with these purple lesions, these Carposis sarcomas, and their bodies had they'd lost so much weight and difficulties breathing. And I, again, I remember feeling very, very impacted by it and sort of scared, but also intrigued. Yeah, I was at a little 16th century cottage watching. <laughs> How long have you had those stomach pains all together? Mm, actually, they started a week ago Wednesday. I see. Yeah. The doctor suspects that John has an unusual form of pneumonia. This Horizon documentary was really good at reflecting the confusion about what was going on. John is the latest victim of a widespread epidemic of bizarre infections, all connected with AIDS. Are they high fevers? Uh, 102. In fact, it was this rare pneumonia that first alerted the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, that something very odd was going on. I even think I might have watched it with my mum being there. And of course, I wasn't out as gay at the time or didn't really know about that. So I remember slightly feeling, as you do at that age, slightly uncomfortable because I knew they were talking about people like me. And so, um, yeah, so I remember being slightly aware of it, but I just, I don't know, that there was something about watching that documentary that really, one, I was intrigued, but even then I thought, you know, something's got to be done. This was just, yeah, so that was what it was like. And you must put in this, you know, this was 1983, 84. Things were different, times were different. Countries. And in America, this new disease has already become an epidemic. Watching this intriguing documentary today, we can experience something of the fear that viewers like Lee must have felt. In New York, this is Greenwich Village. Centred in and around Christopher Street, on the west side of this traditionally bohemian district of Manhattan, is a vast community of gay men, said to be hundreds of thousands. Here, the killer disease has taken its greatest toll of death and of fear among those who walk in its shadow. So the same week that I first went to heaven, the same week that I first had consensual sex with a man, uh, one evening that same week, uh, they had, there was a doc documentary on, Horizon documentary, called Killer in the Village. And it was the first documentary, as far as I'm aware, that was broadcast on British television about HIV. Uh, and it said it was a disease which for which there was no treatment, for which there was no cure, which was fatal. Um, and it was something which you could catch from having sex with an American. And I've just had sex with an American. And I thought, I'm fucked. Just so many people, you know, young people, people of all different ages coming out, coming out onto the scene and immediately facing AIDS. Yeah, it must have been so difficult and confusing. And then also having 
those stories in the media, like the Killer in the Village mm. documentary, the BBC Horizon thing that we played a little clip from, which made this correlation with what was going on in America and especially New York. And didn't you say there was another story that you wanted to tell me about Lee? Yeah, so he also told me that he remembers being in a bar basically a village pub and he overheard these two older gay guys I guess Lee was only like 16 or 17 at this point anyway so basically anyone was older (laughs) and um, they were talking about that they had heard of this disease and they thought that it was an American thing and they were just like oh you know it's going to be an American thing we don't need to worry about it let's just not sleep with any Americans basically Mm. it's really interesting to hear Lee tell that story from the early 80s and the very very early days of the epidemic because that was actually something that was really really pervasive as the documentary killer in the village shows it was perceived from the british point of view at the time to be this american thing and then as you can hear in this next logbook entry that was actually a wider perception as well this fear of americans this is a logbook entry from january the 15th 1986 the volunteer who took the call was david Man phoned to say he had an American friend over, aged 23 years, who was refused at the Golden Lion and asked to leave by the landlord. It wasn't because he was thought to be younger and therefore under age. He had drunk only half a pint, then asked just for a Coke. Person who phoned feared it was an anti-American AIDS fear. Can't be verified as such, but it might be worth bearing in mind for US visitors. Well, it was definitely 1984. I saw my very first copy of Gay Times lying around the house of a guy who was publishing my computer games. And the headline at the time was Gay Plague Overtakes America, or words to that effect. John got AIDS through homosexual contact in America. It is the promiscuous nature of parts of the gay community which has helped spread the disease across the world. Living in a very large city, it becomes a very lonely life. And um, I found that uh, um, being or getting affection from anybody really was um, important. And uh, I found I got a a lot of affection from men. So how much of a threat is AIDS to the general public? How contagious is the disease? Dr. Stuart Glover. This is not a contagion. This is not a disease such as the plague which is spread by by contact. It's not like smallpox which could waft through the atmosphere and the virus could survive out with the human body. I think the, the, the public have been led to believe, misled even, that this is something that uh, is spread by very, very uh, social contact. This is not so. It was a very frightening story. I was already aware that it was illegal to be gay, or I was just becoming aware that it was illegal to be gay. Um, And now I was finding that gay men were dying quite suddenly, and uh, nobody really could understand why. So more or less in the same week that I realised my sexuality, I also realised that it was not an easy position that I found myself in. And I pretty much slammed the door and didn't think about it for some years after that. My name is Neil Cavalier-Smith. I was a volunteer at Switchboard in the late 80s and early 90s. I think the early, the earliest things that struck me from that time, and I can think of two or three particular examples, I think the overriding sense I got was of uncertainty. There was a real uncertainty from everybody. What is this? What do we do? My name is Jane Anderson. I'm a doctor and I specialize in HIV infection. So I qualified on the 1st of August, 1984. I started my first job as a doctor and my first day on call was being on call for the AIDS ward at St. Mary's Hospital. The professor of medicine for people of my generation at that time, um, knew everything. You know, he had he had a huge knowledge. He taught us, and I remember him coming to see a patient with AIDS, and he stood at the bedside and he said, "I I've never seen this before. I I don't know what this is." 
So Switchboard was very much um, in the eye of this because people didn't know who else to call. If they read about it and were worried, who do you call? You call Switchboard. I'm Tony Whitehead. Oh dear, I don't want to lapse into cliché, but it really was at the eye of a storm and the eye of a really nasty thunderstorm because this was... People were starting to die, not in huge numbers back in in in, in eighty three, but in, in in numbers that were significant. Of course, we were hearing all about it, so it felt to us quite quite over overwhelming. Hearing Tony talk about the direct impact on on the calls to switchboard. Switchboard being at the eye of the storm, you know, it it just it it does remind you how what is happening um, in the LGBTQ plus communities or in the mm-hmm. media mm-hmm. has a direct impact on the calls that we get to Switchboard. Yeah, and then to actually think about an individual person who may be someone who calls Switchboard under those circumstances. Mm. In this case, maybe someone who's just newly diagnosed with HIV or something, and. Um, Shall we talk about George? Yeah, let's let's introduce George. Yeah, we've got to introduce you to George, who uh, did not call Switchboard at the time, but he's the kind of person that could have done. He was affected by the epidemic from the very beginning. Should we just let George introduce George? You're right, yeah. Here's George. In 1982, I'd just come back from spending two years in San Francisco, taking part in a gay community experiment where gay and lesbians from all over the world gathered to try and form a majority community. And it was magic because here was a chance to be the majority rather than minority, to have the power, to have the freedom to really start to express who we were. So I'd spent two fabulous and very formative years as a a queer hippie, really, taking part in that wonderful experiment that we all took part in. But when I got back in 82, I brought the HIV virus with me. I, I'd picked it up sometime in the three years before while I was there. My blood was being used in the Hep B trials, which they were taking people from in America. So when the test came in 85, they back-tested me, and I was positive in 1980. So I'm one of the the longest survivors of HIV. It it was really like a personal tsunami. Um, Being told you're going to die, I don't think you can really have a worse sentence put to you in your life. And then watching your lover, your friends all die and just sitting there like a ticking time bomb waiting for your turn to come and it didn't come. Hello, my name is George Hodson. I'm a 71-year, out, proud, fairy queer who's lived with HIV and been blessed to survive for 35 years. This is a logbook entry from October the 22nd, 1985. The volunteer who took the call was Tony. A caller from a northern clinic reports that his doctor has given him no information at all on the result of his test being positive. He was asked to go to a psychotherapist who gave him a leaflet from St Stephen's, but has only offered to introduce him to somebody else in the town who has AIDS and who's come home to die. He is totally depressed has cancelled his hospital appointments and is still ignorant as to what it means and what he can do. Can others log their calls here that show the general incompetence of the medical profession? It might be useful anecdotal evidence later on. This is a logbook entry from 5th of November 1985. The volunteer who took the call was Tony. I'm logging this not as a horror story, but because it may help as ammunition later. At about 12.15 today, a man rang who had been discharged from the Whittington Hospital after a stay of about 10 days. He'd gone in with sudden weight loss, a viral infection, chronic asthma and severe bronchitis. 
these symptoms had been alleviated and he'd been given, obviously, and he confirmed this, a very strong tranquilizer. He had, he said, no idea what was really wrong with him. The doctors had been told by him that he was gay, but if they had done HTLV3 antibody test, they had not told him or informed him of the result. He couldn't get home. Could you strongly dote? And was confused, barely awake and still ill. This is a logbook entry from August 18th, 1986, made by the volunteer Jonathan. St. Thomas's has treated some volunteers disgracefully in connection with HIV at their STD clinic. They have succeeded in bullying some very strong-minded men into taking the test against their will. Another client heard their result from an orderly via a cleaner while waiting. St. Thomas's have a shocking record. On the other hand, St. Mary's tried to talk me out of it. They only agreed when it was clear that I understood the issues and then gave me every opportunity to change my mind. Since then, they have been sensitive and supportive. Have other volunteers had experiences like that at St Thomas's? Should we be recommending people use this band of prats? Just the, some of the reactions from the medics in those entries. I mean, where was, where was the counselling? Yeah, I guess you get the sense that the medics probably don't even know what to do, how to handle this information, how to handle uh, the patients, and, you know, knowing that the situation was actually so bad if you got that diagnosis. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, no one, no one knew what was going on. So now we're going to hear from Mark, who told us about his own day of diagnosis after coming out onto the scene. I was coming home from work. I think I was, I was 15, and I met this guy at bus stop, and he was just gorgeous. I mean, just stunning. And uh, turned out he was a couple of years older than me, and he was my first boyfriend. I'm Mark Thompson. I'm 51, and I came out in the summer of 1985. He introduced me to some of his friends, and I remember my first black gay party. It was the night of July the 13th, 1985. I remember it clearly. Live Aid was on. And um, so we went to this party and it was filled with black gay men. I mean, mind was blown and I was set for life. Kind of. <laughs> You'd go in, they were usually in somebody's house. It was not, these weren't clubs, you know. There would be, you know, a, a, a DJ, you know, playing songs that I knew, my parents knew, my older cousins and stuff. The place so it was very, very black British. Our curry goat and rice, always. Sometimes you get Jamaican patties, good bar you know, rum, and the usual stuff. The party would go like this. During the early parts of the party, there would be um, soul, R&B, so what was ever current at that time, right? So you might get Luther Vandross, Sheryl Lynn, um, Sharon Red, you might get a little bit of soft disco in there, a little bit of funk, um, some Diana Ross classics. Then throughout the night, you'd get some more reggae, but it'd usually be the reggae that we'd grown up on at home, or popular hits. But as the night would wear on, then you'd get Lover's Rock. So that black, British, slow jam kind of stuff. And that's when you'd get a slow dance, you know, or as we would call it, crubbing. So you'd get somebody or they would, you know, invariably get you and be slow dancing up against the wall. You know, very little movement, but a lot of action. <laughs> These are men who are second generation Windrush, you know, because this is the first generation of black gay men born or migrated here, creating their space and their life. First ever. It had never happened before. It was end of November, 86, and um, I'd had tests two weeks before and um, did not expect a positive result. So I tried along. As I said, I had lunch booked with a friend <laughs> that afternoon and um, thought I'd be in and I'd be out. So I'd gone and I remember getting the results and just being just just blown, just completely stunned. And because I wasn't expecting it. And 
it really it wasn't you know people talk about HIV being a death sentence or was a death sentence it wasn't it wasn't I wasn't given a death sentence right I wasn't told by the doctor you will die in six months it was like we don't know we really don't know and that was the hardest thing you know because you didn't know what to plan for if you're gonna die for it and it was shame all these things and I remember leaving to walk to see my friend and I got diagnosed at Westminster Hospital which is a mill bank that's luxury flats now and walking from there to Oxford Circus and all I could think about were, were two things well three things really one telling my mum two my grandfather not telling him but my relationship with him because I was so close to him um, and three that I'd never have children and I always knew even as a, even when I was reconciling my gay stuff I always knew that I was going to be a father that was part of my plan no two ways about it and at that moment that option had been completely taken away from me in that time so it was it was anger it wasn't there wasn't anger at that time that came later that came much later but there was a lot of sadness and disappointment and hurt I did make the lunch day that afternoon and I just met this guy I mean we met at a club and we were gonna have a date and I told him that I just because I was as you can imagine completely shocked because I just got my results and I had to tell him and he was so cool. I mean, so cool. Just, just like you, you're gonna, gonna be okay. I mean, he was scared as well. We didn't date. We didn't go on to date. And um, to this day, I, whenever I see him, you know, I make a point of saying, you know, you, you kind of saved my life. Because if if I had got a negative reaction from that first person, who knows where I could have ended up? And um, I told a couple of friends at the time. And uh, before I knew it, it started to just come out and I'd find out from people like, oh you know like, or I'd meet a guy and I'd tell him and, and he said well I already knew or you know and it was just horrible and so that built up years and years of anger and resentment and I just couldn't be in that space I felt really I felt really unsafe I felt really really unsafe really angry I think more it was more about anger so I had to kind of withdraw That story just shows shows me how HIV affected interpersonal relationships, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So shall we go back to George now and hear a bit more about a big relationship in his life, actually the love of his life, a man called Sam. One always wants to share one's love, doesn't one? I was working in Singapore for a year, which is like, it's okay, but it's like the dreariest town in, you know, and, I'm an old hippie and there was no dope and you got smacked if you spat out any chewing gum, but I just got my head down. It was an introduction to Asia. So one one holiday, I thought, oh, bugger this, I'm going off to Bangkok and I'm going to smoke dope and dance the night away. And I ended up in this wonderful ladyboy club where there's this exquisite drag. And then I saw this tall, handsome man with a black moustache and he was wearing like an officer and a gentleman outfit which is a, a sign of the civil service used to wear and I was on the dance floor I'd had a tie stick in the taxi going there and hadn't smoked for a year and was just way out of it and I could see he was watching me and I thought yeah that, that looks nice and I hadn't had sex for a year because in Singapore you know you have sex you have your willy cut off almost <laughs> so I thought, wow, he, he's so lovely. So, And he moved next to me and started talking in beautiful English. And it was just that wonderful moment that hopefully we all get a chance of having in life where you ting with someone. You just know that this is someone who you can create things with, who you can share things with who you can grow with, and we were never apart for the rest of our time. Yeah. Eight years before he died, yes, which wasn't enough, but it was still very powerful. I've got a lovely picture I'll show you when we finished of Sam in, in a portrait in my bedroom. This is a logbook entry from March the 7th, 1987, 
Caller Patrick from York had an antibody positive test with no counselling at all. Had his lover Martin died of AIDS three weeks ago. Wouldn't talk to me but knows my name. Called at 4.13 on March the 8th, hence this incoherent scribble. He could call back at any time. Please be gentle. He's scared stupid. Bless the doctors. They they took this failed a chemotherapy drug, drug and gave it to people at huge doses. I mean, they didn't know what they were doing. And it was AZT trials that killed more people than HIV at that time. My partner, Sam, I was offered the choice of it. We both were. Sam went on AZT and shriveled and shrunk and was dead in six months. I, I said, I don't want to go on it. I want to just carry on. I'd seen so many people die, but of course to see your grand passion die in agony and degradation, as so many of us did in the bad days, was awful, awful. Yeah. But, and I still carry him with me, you know, with this cancer when I was going through the MRI scan. I visualized and pulled him around me like a kind of suit of armor, if that makes any sense. Those we lost and love, we still, I still pull them up and bring them to me when I'm in crisis or, or scared. Those that we love and lose, we don't really lose them. They just are, there are guardian angels behind us, and when we need them, we can pull their energy and their love and their memories to us to stabilize us, to strengthen us, to give us equilibrium, to love us still, yeah, and remind us that we need to love ourselves as well. Oh my God. It's really sad, but really uh, gorgeous at the same time. Yeah. To hear George. Yeah. Do you want to, should we just both try? Listener, if you want to take a pause at this moment with us. Yeah. <laughs> We're just having a breather. Okay, we're back. We've we've had a little break. And we're going to go into hearing from someone who helped to care for patients with HIV and AIDS. Hello, my name's Lee Chislett. At the age of 21, I started working at a HIV ward in central London. When I finally got to work in the sexual health clinic, there was, you started seeing people come in who, with their partners who couldn't breathe and these awful carposis sarcoma and really so it was really quite shocking to, to just to see that change so I think I was there when it really started when we thought we've got we've got a problem here it's hit it's hit London so even before I got to the HIV ward um, I was work, working on a surgical ward as a, as a student nurse I was coming to the end of my training and you know as I said before I was this jolly nurse who was always joking and that sort of thing and we got a patient I remember his face so distinctly it, it, it had got out on the ward somehow with the families and the thing that we had somebody with AIDS on the ward and I remember that the, the relatives were coming and saying they wanted their families moved they said they wouldn't have they didn't want their families near anything like that or with somebody with AIDS part of it was fear part of it was hate and I remember feeling, getting really, really angry during the shift. And then I caught some of the relatives. There was a, like a little glass window on the door, you know, on the door. And people were peering through the glass. And I remember, I remember just getting so, I said, excuse me, can I help you? And just, it was just ghastly. It was just so demeaning and dehumanising. I just, the sister said to me, you're very quiet today, Lee, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not okay. I said, now this is where I get emotional. I said, you have just treated that man like an animal in the zoo. 
And I just, and I just sort of go and I said, I've never been so ashamed to be a nurse, let alone a human being. One particular story stands out in my mind, and this was actually off a, a, a young guy at the London Lesbian and Gay Centre, not too long after I first started to DJ there. So it would have been around 1987. I'm DJ Rithu. He was only 16. He'd come into London from somewhere north in the country and everyone loved him he was such a sweet boy really very clearly gay you know very clear about who he was used to quite often wear shorts and like little bobby socks and a pair of dms and the way his haircut was you know he was just very beautiful and um we all knew him and were really friendly with him and we were around him for the best part of a year before he committed suicide, but when he found out he was HIV positive. It was just, you know, heartbreaking. I mean, that was his life. Finished at 16. 16 going on 17. So, yeah, it was it was a difficult time. And, and I mean, I, I, I was very clear that even if I was in any way at risk by being friends with gay men who were positive then I would take that risk. Um, I was very clear that I, I, I would support my friends, my gay male friends, um, and I wasn't going to be scared away, and I was not going to treat them like lepers. Um, and I'm very glad I made that decision. I went into this young guy, and he, you know, stunningly good looking, although that matters, but he had this big purple lesion on his nose, which was the Carposis sarcoma. And, you know, he was very quiet, very shy. And, you know, I go bursting in as my one, hi, how are you? I'm Lee, I'm looking up at his day. And I really was struggling to engage with him, really struggling to engage with him. And, you know, he was saying the odd yes or no. And, and as I was in the room, um, he, he looked, I don't know, he looked deflated, he looked sad. He opened some tinfoil that was on his little table in front of the bed and he opened this tinfoil and it had some little samosas. I can't remember, some, somebody bought it in, some food in because at the time people, some of the cleaners wouldn't go in the rooms, you know, to bring the food in. So he had this little tinfoil and he, he started eating some food and I, and I said, oh, that looks nice. I said, God, they look really lovely. And he looked up at me and he said, would you like some? Would you like one? And, um, and, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, that would be nice. You know, as I said, just being greedy. So I remember and I said, oh, that looks really nice. So I, so I was eating one. And he suddenly got quite emotional. And, you know, when somebody, you can see they're trying to fight back the tears. And then he sobbed. I mean, sobbed. Like, it was just, quite, it was so pitiful to watch. And at first I thought I'd done something wrong and I didn't realise what I'd done wrong. And um, what I realised is, is I'd accepted his food. And I, I couldn't quite get my head around it. That he felt so isolated and so, I don't know, like a leper, that somebody would take in his food and, you know, I just wanted to sit on the side of bed and I think we both cry, frankly. There was um, a guy on the ward who, um, it was, it, 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 so he, his partner, so it was a, he was a big sort of bear of a guy and his partner was in and his partner had got this cryptosporidium and he really, his cheeks were protruding. He was, I can't, I hope I don't offend when I say this, but he was thin like you see, do you know those images of people coming out of concentration camps? And I hope I don't offend, but that's the only way I can describe it. His teeth were, it was just so sad to see, you know, especially when you saw the photograph of him on the thing. But his partner would not leave his side for one moment. Not for one moment. So he would ring the buzzer and say, Lee, will you sit with him whilst I go to the toilet? And, you know, and occasionally I'd say, please go for a coffee. I promise you I won't leave him. And he used to get this bowl and lift his head up because he was so weak and, and, and wash his hair and get this little pink sponge and just slowly clean his teeth and you know he used to really gently be gentle with him and his and his partner would you know with every ounce of strength would try and hold his hand oh it was just 
in some ways it was sad and pitiful. But I think what I learned from that is I didn't know that gay men could love each other. Nobody had taught me that. Nobody had taught me that. Isn't that weird when you think about that? And that was after he died. And after I witnessed that, I knew and I vowed I would never be ashamed of my sexuality again. Because not only could I see two men love each other, I'd never seen love like it. I didn't know two human beings could love each other like that. So I think that had a real impression. I didn't think of it consciously at the time, but I think that had a real, real strong impression on me. And I guess the other thing that impacted me was a, a guy called Paul, who was a sex worker. Um, and he used to tell me about all his sexual exploits and that. And I was, again, 21, young and innocent. Not so much now, but I was young and innocent. And uh, he used to, and I loved him. He was, you know, all right, yeah, you love him, much like that. And, you know, we got, we, I got really close to him. And I remember, I, I, remember, I remember going into his room and he lost a lot of weight and his legs had really swollen and had these huge carposis sarcomas. And I walked in and he'd cut his jeans off, these little white jeans, and he cut them really short. You know, he had this Hickman line, they said we used to put lines in because we, they had so many different kooky drugs. There. And, um, and it, this little T-shirt, and you know, he was unwell. And I went, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm going to Pride. He said, I'm going to Pride, and I tell you what, you're effing coming with me. And um, I couldn't go with him, but we, we got him there. He went to Pride, and he, you know, and he was going, I don't care, Lee. And at the time, we used to have like this pancake makeup to try and cover the lesions. And he goes, no, nah, that's Pride, huh? Paul, he said, I wish people would stop telling me I'm brave. He said, I want to live, I don't want to die. So I'm not brave. I'm just, get up in the morning, take a breath and hope I'm here the next day. I was going on a week's holiday and somebody said, oh, Paul wants to, oh, wants to speak to you before, before you go. And I went, oh, OK, OK, OK. So I said, uh, you know, I went, oh, oh, so, oh, I said, yeah, I'm going on holiday for a week. And he said, um, oh, Lee, I'm probably going to be dead by the time you come back. Will you come to my funeral? So I had to And it was very matter of fact, and he was right. It was obvious that something as big as this was going to hit Switchboard, right? I mean, Switchboard had been setting itself up, actually, for eight or nine years, probably to, to be able to deal with something as big as this. There's this logbook entry from October the 2nd, 1985, in all caps, underlined, it says, WARNING. Rog Hudson has just died. You know what to expect. Well, well, actually, it, it, I don't think it did realise, I don't think anyone realised mm. that this was going to be happening or coming. You know, it was this tsunami yeah. that hit the communities, that, like Tony mentioned earlier on. Extra calls, you know, all of this reaction in the newspapers. There, we didn't know what was coming. No one did. And I think another really important thing to remember is that, you know, Switchboard volunteers were there to support the LGBTQ plus communities, but they were also, they were also from that community. And it's no surprise that it would come home to switchboard. We did start to lose volunteers as well. And that always makes you really concentrate on what's going on when people you know start literally just disappearing from the phone room. And then you hear that they're in hospital and then you hear that they've died. I'm Lisa Power and I was a volunteer on switchboard between 1979 and 1994. Um, and people often didn't actually say what they had. I mean, even the volunteers at Switchboard, we were the most out gay people in the UK. We were the most well-equipped to handle all of this. And even we couldn't talk about it 
when it was our friends. Um, you know, I can remember being at home and getting a call about um, somebody, George Michael, or not not George Michael as in you would think, but George Meikle is probably the correct pronunciation. It's a Scottish surname. And that he had died and I just burst into tears. Um, you know, we were not immune to what was going on. In fact, we were at the heart of it. Logbook entry, 3rd of February, 1987. I recently got the result of my HIV antibody test. Positive. Doing all the right things, phoning body positive, seeing the health advisor at the clinic and so on. The one thing I want, I really want to do right now, I can't. That's to talk to other antibody positive people at Switchboard. The reason I can't is that I don't know who you are. How does being antibody positive affect the way you see Switchboard? How does it affect your phone work? And so on and so on. I'm not yet ready to come out other than to certain individuals within Switchboard. So after an early morning heart-to-heart -heart with Frida, brackets, the number one dyke in town, on brackets, the suggestion is that her pigeonhole could be a mailing address and she'll pass on any messages unopened. So far, we seem to have been fairly lucky as regards AIDS but it's getting closer to home on a daily basis. What's the point of saying that we welcome applications from antibody positive people, though it's some time since we last made that plain in public, where we got no support system there? I'm not sure what I'm saying we should do, but I think we've got to do something. And yes, this is my way of dealing with the news. Please drop me a line, care of Frida. How can we help ourselves? How can we help if one of us becomes ill? How many other questions are there? Hope to hear from you soon. Love. Sorry, no name yet. You know, that was an anonymous entry. Even, even at the heart of the uh, LGBTQ plus community switchboard, people were still struggling to come out as positive. You know, imagine that volunteer who, who couldn't put their name to this entry. Just imagine what it felt like asking for help in that way. Yeah, because at that moment, people like that anonymous volunteer really needed support. They needed to feel a community around them. Well, at the height of it, it was magic. We were like, you know, you know those penguins that huddled together in the cold on the documentary? We were like that. We were huddled up trying to survive and one by one, like herd, we were picked off by this virus. I can't imagine what it felt like at that period of time. Um, and I can't imagine what it feels like to be someone who is still alive today, who lost so many people um, throughout the 80s and 90s. Yeah, and, and what's happening to the LGBTQ plus elderly, but specifically the HIV positive elderly? Mm -hmm. What you know, where's where's their community? Who's supporting them? So moving into the final section of this episode, bringing us up to date. Let's hear from George again. He's going to tell us about the kind of support people like him need today. What I'm worried about is, and this is quite an important personal point, the lack of my feeling of sense of community at the moment. I think the younger people of different communities have forgotten about us old survivors. We were warriors. We fought. We gave our lives. And there's a group of us like myself who now are not being respected, not being remembered. We're the forgotten. We're very small now, again a bit like Holocaust survivors who are dying out. But for me, I'm 71 now, 
I haven't worked for 30 years. My work was surviving. And now, if I take a fall this afternoon, I'm going to be shipped off to a homophobic care home because I have no money, I have no choice, I have no savings. And that's very scary because I can't be who I want to be in my final days. And form, it doesn't take a huge amount to form a little group of shared accommodation where we can be safe with each other and looked after, a bit like the London Lighthouse used to be, where we can have our last chapters without having to worry about dying to Vera Lynn on the loop here. Yeah. <laughs> but I would ask the younger generations of peoples of difference to just think about spending some time and effort together to form a kind of community of safe accommodation where we can be looked after with dignity. And that's what I'm really hoping. I, But I'm old and tired now, but... I'm hoping that some of the younger activists will see the need to honour and remember us in this way. I think sadly from the work we do as well that's not uncommon to hear that especially the fear of having the smallest of accidents and then having to be put into care that you don't you don't have the decision over i think that's a, a tonic especially that's why we want to make things happen as soon as possible because the demand is there we know that there's in london especially the demand for lgbt specific older housing is enormous hi i'm matthew from tonic housing um, we are working to create vibrant and inclusive LGBT affirming retirement communities. Some of the challenges that we've faced, and this isn't just the tonic, this is across um, the sector as well, is trying to explain the need. People seem to assume that you kind of, especially being LGBT, you get to a certain age and that's kind of that element of your life is over and then you're just an old person. You fit with every other old person and that's and that's that, but... It's obviously not the case. And we've got such a rich history that is not being looked after. Stories are, are disappearing. People are not being given the support that they need. So one of the things that George's story has reminded me of is a statistic from our recent Building Safe Choices report. And that statistic says over 15% of respondents identified as having HIV when they were asked about their care needs. Now, that survey had over 620 responses, which makes it the largest of its kind of older LGBT people done in the UK so far. Another big, big challenge and, and quite dark issue is that LGBT people are feeling like they have to go back in the closet in order to feel safe, whether that's extra care, housing, um, social or medical care. And the reason for that is just a lot of staff are not trained for the specific needs that um, the community has. It's getting better, but again, it's just nowhere It's nowhere close to where it needs to be. I think a final challenge, and this is kind of beyond just our community, this is a, an age thing. We've got a really bad culture in the UK when it comes to discussing ageing. We don't do it like other countries. You've got countries across Scandinavia, in Europe, the US, where older living and retirement communities are a big deal. It's just a natural part of life. New Zealand is another example. Whereas... In the UK especially, I'll use a phrase that my nan and granddad have said, you live your life, you kind of hit 60, 70, and you're thrown on the scrap heap. Whether that is taken to a care home, left alone at home, there's there's no option of the in-between. And that's kind of what we're trying to, trying to do here. At the minute, what we're trying to do is open a, a shared ownership scheme in central London and it will only be small to begin with obviously the enormous dream is to have a tonic building from the ground up and it'll have hundreds of places for people to live in but unfortunately it's not how the housing system works in the UK so we're starting off small it'll be shared ownership to begin with but the long term dream is that once we filled those and we've already got a register of interest and that is filling up really fast once we fill those we can then use that as evidence 
to different councils across the city to say, here is the backlog of people that we know are ready to move into a place or they may not be able to buy, they need they may need social um, housing or they want to privately rent. We can then move forward once we've got the collateral from the first place and hopefully begin to open more tonic communities. We're doing all of this important work behind the scenes at the minute and it may not look much from the outside, but one of the key phrases that I want to keep using in the market especially is that moving in is just the start. It's like the start to the rest of your life. Um, it's a place to live your lives out. And it is, I think, just the beginning for housing generally, for LGBT people. I mean, I don't know if this could go out in your podcast, but I, I call for people to gather and use their individual skills to help create this much needed facility for our elders, for us old queens, because we've given so much. In the next episode, we will be continuing the story of HIV AIDS. Focusing on all the responses from Switchboard to doctors and also the government. Calls to Switchboard are confidential, so to bring the logbooks to life, we've changed the callers' names. The Logbooks is produced by Shivani Dave, Tash Walker and Adam Smith in partnership with Switchboard, the LGBT plus helpline. If you think other people would like the Logbooks, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. These ratings and reviews really help others to discover the show. You can send us your feedback and stories to hello at thelogbooks.org or join the conversation on social media with the hashtag thelogbooks. Our music is by Tom Foskett Barnes and our artwork is by Natalie Dotto. Thanks to Steph Dickers and team at the Bishopsgate Institute, the BFI National Archive, the folks at ACAST, MACE, the Media Archive for Central England, Peter Zaccaroli at West Digital, Content is Queen, the staff and volunteers at Switchboard, and all the contributors who shared their stories. Switchboard continues to take phone calls from 10am to 10pm every day. If you're affected by any of the issues in this podcast or need to discuss anything to do with your gender identity or sexuality, you can call Switchboard on 0300 330 0630, email chris at switchboard.lgbt or instant message via switchboard.lgbt where you can also donate money or time to help.